It's Rog, and with the transfer window down to its last four and a bit days, as we storm towards this Friday's fraught, frantic 6pm Eastern time deadline, it's time to revel in the embers of the football fire with a man with the fastest thumbs in the game. It is a joy to spend the next 30 minutes breaking down all that is to come with him. Oh, with the host of the magnificent Here We Go podcast, subscribe to it now, where all good podcasts are available. This conversation presented by the GFOPs at New Balance. Oh, the best new in football since Newcastle. Live from Milan, the city that Christian Pulisic built. It's my friend, the Oracle, Benvenuto, from Riccio Romani. Thank you, my friend. Nice to be here. Thank you for the amazing invitation and introduction as always. And uh, Really happy to be here. Many things to discuss. It's going to be a crazy week. So you ready look to go. bloody good for it, Fab. I, I do don't. want to tell you. You do. <laughs> I don't know what you're doing, but you look amazing. Quick reminder, Thank listeners. You. We're here on the AMP app where you can ask your questions live on this pod. Request to call in. We'll move you to the stage. For those of you listening to this as a podcast, just download the AMP app. Come be with us next time. Uh, but let's dive in. I am somewhere in the next 30 minutes going to try and trick you into saying the magical words Mbappe to Everton. Here we go. <laughs> but big question first. Transfer window is peak Fabrizio. It's like your bar mitzvah. You are the center of the football world. Can you describe, <laughs> serious question, how much sleep you're getting a day right now and when? Look, my friend, it's very difficult. Uh, it's very difficult for me to sleep for two reasons, especially now at the end of transfer window, the pressure, the idea to, to try and to text people. My mind is always focused only on football every single day of my life. But especially in this week, in these final 10 days and now with the final week, it's completely crazy because I don't want to miss anything, any single detail, not just information, not just news, but it's also about the details. And so I'm trying to text every single person who comes to my mind who can have an information, a detail, a story. Uh, I can try to call them every single minute. So it's really complicated to sleep because my mind, even when I'm sleeping, even if it's three hours or four hours, is always processing information. Three, three days ago, it happened to me that I was sleeping uh, like three, four hours. And I started to dream that I was missing some news on Chelsea. So I woke up during the night and I was like, OK, I'm missing something. It was a blonde player who was going to Chelsea. I don't remember anything else, but I was like, OK, what's going on? So you can understand that for me. Were, were, the, were the neck tattoos? Were the neck tattoos involved? We're breaking Fabrizio dream no. news here. But this Great. transfer window... It's been more bonkers than ever because of the emergence yeah. of the Saudi Arabian League wallet snapping up the likes of Benzema, the entire old guard of the Liverpool midfield, every piece of Chelsea dead wood, as well as a late surge of new talent, including 21-year-old Spanish midfield prodigy Gabriel Vega. But you professionally, how has the emergence of the Saudi League changed things in terms of the new connections, the new information sources that you've had to develop in football in the blink of an eye? Yeah, honestly, it was, um, was complicated, i tell you the truth, because when it started with Cristiano Ronaldo in January, I was lucky enough to be there in Saudi uh, to be at the debut game of Cristiano Ronaldo with Al Nasser. And I was lucky, really lucky, because I had the opportunity to create some contact uh, with the correct people and so to be ready this summer to be in touch with some people who helped me to get all the information but honestly speaking to many colleagues who are journalists at top level here in Europe maybe in Spain in England it was complicated for all of us me included uh, to get the best sources and to get the right stories because a lot of people uh, was maybe texting journalists and telling them okay I have an information from you about Al Nasser, Al Ittihad, Al Hilal and then many of these stories were not correct or not true or not completely true so you know, to do an accurate job was very difficult. Uh, even for me, at the beginning of the transfer window, was complicated. Then I started to understand who were the people to, to text, the people to trust, uh, and also to have those contacts from January when Cristiano moved to Al Nasser made a difference for me. But it was really complicated. It's, it's like restarting uh, on a yeah. journalistic point of view. God, yeah. The transfer window still open in Saudi Arabia for an entire week after England and Europe, the window shuts, yep. which may and will create all kinds of complications as we will talk through. But let's dive in. First up, Liverpool Football Club. Really an impressive window from my always objective perspective <laughs> as an Everton fan. No Bellingham, <laughs> nor Caicedo, not even a Lavia, but Alexis McAllister, Soberschlei, 
and Wataro Endo Legendo. That midfield, though, does look <laughs> slightly unbalanced still after half of it up and off to live amongst the piles of cash in Saudi Arabia. 21 year old Dutch terrier Ryan Gravenberch got just three games last season in the Bundesliga with Bayern Munich. It's been linked to both Liverpool and United, whereas once Ajax daddy Eric Ten Hag is now. And I feel, Fabrizio, because I listen to your podcast twice a week, religiously, you've been talking about Ryan Gravenberch moving for a long time now, Fab. Can you see him learning to speak Scouse come Friday night, moving to play with Klopp? <laughs> I think it's a, it's a possibility, honestly. It's not an easy deal. You know why? Because Liverpool have always been interested in Ryan Gravenberg and same for Manchester United. So both clubs in June, in July, called the agents of the player, which is the agency uh, from Raiola. So it's the same group created by the great Mino Raiola and now with the same people taking care of the, of the negotiations. And so they, they've been in contact in June, in July with the agency of the player to be informed of the conditions of the deal. But the answer was always the same. Not for sale. Uh, he's not untouchable and he's a player they want to keep at Bayern for the entire season. Then what happened is that two weeks ago, so in August, uh, Liverpool and Man United reached out again to the agents and they told them both clubs with the same strategy till the final day of the transfer window. So till the deadline day, if anything changes, let us know because we will be ready to make a move. Manchester United have Eric Hag, who of course has a great relationship with the player, knows him so well uh, since Ajax time, but it's also true that at the moment for Man United, the financial per play situation is not that easy. So probably they are only prepared to make a loan move for Ryan Gravenberg, but also Liverpool. Liverpool need a player in that position and Gravenberg is under the percent included in their list alongside other players because for example Ducure uh, from uh, Crystal Palace is a player they really appreciate but is probably too expensive in this moment but Liverpool have the financial possibilities to go to Bayern and pay what they want for Ryan Gravenberg. So both clubs are still waiting at the moment they don't have any green light from Bayern to start a concrete negotiation but Liverpool are there. Liverpool like the player, Liverpool had very good contacts with his camp and so in case the situation changes around Bayern on Tuesday, on Wednesday or on Thursday, they will be prepared to bid for Ryan Gravenberg. Question from a viewer at Coffee JT. Is the Mo Salah to Saudi Arabia real fab? Where does the rumour even come from? Where's it started? Is the truth in it at all? Does Mo want a new life in Saudi Arabia? And what do Liverpool do to protect themselves as that Saudi window is open for one week longer than the English one? They could be left scrambling if he just ups and goes. Honestly, I think uh, to answer your question, the first part of your question, the the answer is yes. It's absolutely real. It's absolutely true. And they are trying with a very big salary proposal for Mo Salah. So Mo is tempted, but I think this is very human. When you get this kind of proposal and you see many other stars going to Saudi, it's difficult not to be tempted. Okay, Mo Salah is a legend at Liverpool. Liverpool level is completely different than Saudi clubs. We all know that. But it's also true that the salary package is very close to Cristiano Ronaldo's salary. So imagine it would be one of the biggest uh, in, in the world of football. So it's complicated not to be tempted. But it's also true that in this story, uh, someone started to say, okay, the agreement is imminent. It's going to be completed on Saturday, on Sunday, on Monday. No, we are not at that stage because in this story, there is also Liverpool. And so to answer the second part, of your question, I don't think Liverpool are that worried to lose Mo Salah in the final days or in the extra week of transfer market for, uh, for Saudi clubs because they have no intention to negotiate. This is what Liverpool are saying in private conversations and this is what Liverpool are saying in public with Jurgen Klopp in press conferences or after the game uh, at Newcastle, he sent the same message. So Liverpool have no intention to negotiate. Liverpool can't lose a player like Mo Salah with three, four days left on the transfer window. And so I think this is very, very difficult, very unlikely. And I see Mo Salah staying at Liverpool. Where there is finger tape ripped off in anger, there is fire. But let's talk about Manchester United, that exquisite corpse of a footballing squad. Big arrivals, young, unproved, uh, and now injured striker Rasmus Hoyland. Um, out with injuries, Mason Mount and the erratic wonder of goalkeeper Andre and Nana watching them. Despite all the money they spent this United squad, it still feels like they need reinforcements all over the field. Season goal scorer, a defensive anchor uh, in that midfield. And now Paul Luke Shaw, set for a spell out injured, huge loss at left back. Which of these challenges will be fixed come Friday night? 
I think there are three priorities for uh, for Manchester United. The first one will be completed very soon, and this is the backup goalkeeper because they need to cover that position. This Anderson is going to Crystal Palace on permanent transfer. He completed the medical today. So they are signing Bajin Deal, who is a Turkish goalkeeper, joining from Fenerbahce on 7 million euros deal. The player is already in Manchester doing some medical check uh, because he was not 100% fit in the last couple of months, but everything will be completed soon for Bajindir to, to Manchester United. Then the midfielder. The midfielder is the real priority. We know they had contacts for Sofian Amrabat. Also Pierre Oyberg from Tottenham has been offered to Manchester United in the last couple of days. But at the moment, no direct contact between clubs yet for Oyberg. So not sure it's going to be a priority target. But Man United are looking for that kind of player. So a defensive midfielder, someone who can help also on the defensive uh, side of the of the game because of course they signed Mason Mount who is a fantastic creative player but they need something else in that position let me say that it's going to be crucial to see what happens with Scott McTominay and with Donny van de Beek because I have a feeling that for Donny van de Beek especially the situation is still open so there is a chance for him to leave the club in the final days of the transfer window and things are happening behind the scenes for Donny so keep an eye on that one and then the left back, because the injury of Luke Shaw last week was a big problem for Manchester United. It's not a short-term injury. It's going to take some weeks, probably months, to see Luke Shaw back uh, in the squad. And this is why they're looking for a new left back. Today, they had contacts for Marco Cureia, but Chelsea want loan fee plus salary covered. Also, uh, Sergio Reguillon is a cheap opportunity from Tottenham because they would not require a big loan fee. They would require the salary covered. And also the opportunity of Marcos Alonso from Barcelona. So these three players are in the list at Manchester United and they will sign a new left-back and a percent in the final days of the transfer. Well, Glazers, if you're listening, I can get you Mikalenko for 100 million. But let's go to <laughs> Chelsea. In many regards, no one loves wheeling and dealing more than them. I mean, essentially, Todd Burley is Mr. Transfer Window. All it takes, I do believe this, Fab, is for you to tweet about a player and, and Todd just seems to want to buy them. I think you are Chelsea's scout. I mean, Caicedo, Lavia, Nkunku, De Sassi, Nicholas Jackson, Roberto Sanchez, New England Revolution goalkeeper Georgi Petrovic, amongst the vast incomings, enormous transfer outlay, offset, it should be said, by selling so much dead wood in the general vicinity of Riyadh. Mauricio Pochettino said, Pochettino said after winning this weekend, we want one offensive player more rather than out and out nine. We want a striker who can play across the front line. What do you expect? Uh, this is, I think, is going to be the biggest surprise of the transfer window in the final days because... Honestly, I want to be very honest with you and with our listeners. I spent the whole day, yesterday and today, trying to find the right name. At the moment, I can't share too much, but I'm hearing that they are trying to discuss for many opportunities. So they are rediscussing internally now. We know that Chelsea, the structure is uh, involved in many players, in, in many people, sorry, into the decision to, to pick the right player. So it's about the owners with Todd Bowley, Bedanek Bali, but of course, the board with uh, Paul Wayne Stanley, Lauren Stewart, Joe Shields. They were all together today at Coban to decide the right player. So the player they wanted was Michael Olise from Crystal Palace. That deal was almost done. And then Palace, in almost 24 hours, were able to change the story and to keep the player at the club with a new contract. So in that case, congrats to Palace because they've been very smart and very fast in reacting to Chelsea triggering the release clause for, uh, for Michael Olise. And after what happened with Olise, with the news leaked in the media, Chelsea want to keep their name for the new creative offensive player as secret as possible. So this is why Chelsea are discussing internally. Uh, they had some contacts for Barcola from Lyon. Remember this name, guys, if you don't know him. This is a fantastic talent. Fantastic. He's a winger, super fast player. This is going to be a, a star in the future. But at the moment, what I'm hearing is that the owner, the new owner of uh, Olympic Lyon, John Textor, who is working hard to, to change the situation, it's not an easy one at Lyon, he wanted player as part of the deal. And he wanted Andre Santos from Chelsea. But Chelsea already loaned Andre Santos to Nottingham Forest. So the deal almost collapsed last week. At the moment, it's not something concrete for Bradley Barcola to, to Chelsea. Let's see what's going to happen with other names. Brendan Johnson, I'm told at the moment, is not a priority. And so Chelsea will do something, for sure. That player will arrive, but they're still discussing internally about who is the right candidate for that place. Does it rhyme with Schmiel Bupe? You don't need to just, <laughs> just nod if it does. By the way, quick, quick fire question. Do you expect yeah. Conor Gallagher to still be a Chelsea player come Saturday morning? I think yes. I think, yes, he has a chance to stay. Also because Chelsea want to send 
also some kind of message to the young players they have in the squad that someone from Coban has to be part of the squad. They already sold too many players this summer. It was needed absolutely for financial fair play and also to clean the squad. But I think Conor Gallagher has good chances to stay at the club. Oh, Arsenal Football Club, big summer spending, really an effort to win and win now. David Raya, Declan Rice, Kai Havertz and the cruelly injured uh, Timber club legend Matt Turner amongst those on the move out. Any panic there in terms of defensive cover needed before the end of the window um, and that Balogun money burning a hole in Stan Kroenke's pocket? Yeah, honestly, at the moment, no panic at all. Uh, Arsenal are very happy with the squad they have. Of course, they are a bit disappointed because Jarin Timber was one of the most exciting signings of the transfer window. So they were very happy with him. He was very unlucky with this, uh, this injury, but they will wait for him, of course. And at the moment, they are not in panic at all. Uh, they will only do something if they find the right opportunity, as they did, I think it was two years ago, with Tomiyasu from Bologna. It was a last-minute move, but because they really trusted the player, uh, he's able to play in different positions. So if they find that kind of opportunity, they will do something on the market. Otherwise, they're very happy with the squad they have uh, right now. So um, also, they have Gabriel Magalhães, who's not playing in the last couple of games, but he's an important player and he will be really important for Arsenal. So at the moment, they feel that they have a very good squad. If they can find the right player in the final days, they will be ready. Otherwise, they're happy with the squad they have. And Flo Balogun will be in Monaco tomorrow. Eh? The deal is done. It will be signed tomorrow morning. The player will undergo medical test. Everything is ready for him to, to fly to Monaco and to become the new striker. God, a nation rejoices for their gents who scored in 50% of the two games he's played for the US men's national team. <laughs> I want to take questions from our listeners, uh, but two quick ones before we do. Fab, name one massive move that you expect to happen before Friday. Honestly, in terms of money, uh, I think one of the biggest is going to be Randall Colomboni to Paris Saint-Germain. Uh, Paris Saint-Germain did a very, I think, a very good campaign with very good signings. For example, I loved Manuel Ugarte, who is a very good player, maybe underrated in the media as they signed him early stages in the transfer window, but this is a very good player. But I think Randall Colomboni is going to be the next one for, for Paris Saint-Germain because the negotiation with Eintracht is advancing very well. This boy is very good and Paris Saint-Germain want to bring in French players. So after Ousmane Dembélé, they really want to go for Randall Colomoni with Hugo Kitike included in the negotiation with Eintracht. So going uh, on the opposite way to, to Eintracht Frankfurt. The agreement is getting closer. The negotiation will continue tomorrow. But I think Colomoni could be one of the big names and it's going to be something around 80 million euros. So big money again for Paris Saint-Germain. Last one for me before we take these questions. Um, and coming up onto the stage, Victor Osserman. It's a gent carved out of goals. 24-year-old Nigerian. Just a sensationally potent footballer. I think he racked up his 100th goal for Napoli this weekend. How did he go nowhere this weekend? This window? Yeah. Honestly, I'm surprised too, if you want my honest opinion. I'm, I'm following Serie A, of course. I'm Italian. I live in Italy. And I'm still surprised to see Victor Rosiman staying in Serie A this season too. Uh, because he's been incredible last year. Look, I think it was really difficult to negotiate with Napoli. Because even when Saudi clubs arrived, especially Al Hilal, in the last two, three weeks, they approached Napoli. They had a concrete negotiation with Napoli and with the player for, it, for Victor Rosiman. And they were close to reaching an agreement with Rosiman. So usually when it's this kind of negotiation is very difficult to resist for European clubs, as we saw for many stars this summer. But Napoli were always on the point. We are not going to accept less than 200 million euros. So when Alilal were approaching with 140, 150 plus some adults, for Napoli was, don't come here with less than 200 million euros. So congrats to Napoli, because I think keeping Victor Rosiman was like signing a superstar player, because it was very difficult. And so I think that kind of price tag made it impossible for English clubs, but even for Paris Saint-Germain or any Spanish club. It was impossible to go there and pay 200 million euros. So credits to the president, De Laurentiis, because when he mentioned 200 million euros price tag, honestly, I was not trusting him. I, th I was thinking, OK, maybe for 140, 150, he will sell. He didn't. He'll be playing it into Miami this time next year. Welcome, Victor. <laughs> but now to our favourite part of the show, the part where we get to speak with you, dear listeners, answer your questions. Now is the time, America, to speak with the gent on the pulse of the transfer window about whom your club is buying or selling right here on this podcast. You know how it works. Request to call in. We'll move you to the stage. Stay unmuted until we shout you out. But let's dive in. Starting with at ball platitude. Tell us where you're from and what's your question for the mighty Fabrizio. 
Hi, Fab. Hi, Raj. Um, I am Ben from Southwestern Virginia, Christiansburg to be specific, Hokie territory. <laughs> um, <laughs> my question was about Arsenal. Um, and we already talked about it, but um, Gabriel, um, the defender, is there any um, uh, any proof to um, like rumors around him leaving the club? Good question, because, you know, this is a very strange situation. To see Gabriel on the bench was really surprising in the last three games for Arsenal. And many people in the industry are very surprised. But then when I've been asking to my source at Arsenal, the answer I got last week and this week, so in the last couple of hours, was always the same. We are not selling Gabriel. He's a crucial player for us. We have Timber injured, so Gabriel is going nowhere. So that is the position of, of Arsenal. I think probably was some tactical decision by Nicola Arteta. Uh, if they really will keep Gabriel at the club, I expect him to be part of the rotation and to be part of the starting eleven in the next weeks. So at the moment, Arsenal have not received anything formal or, or official from Saudi clubs and they want to keep Gabriel. This is their very clear message. Question, by the way, God bless to you in Blacksburg. Shout out to, Insta, to Interstate 81. Oh, it is a joy to be with you. Question via Twitter. Jamie Golding of New York City asks, Fab, why did Flo Balagan not get Premier League offers? So many bloody teams need goals. I think it's not that they didn't receive Premier League proposals, but probably to sell the player in the Premier League made things more complicated for Arsenal because they didn't want to give the player for the same price to Premier League clubs. And I think it's also something we can understand. And also, no one was paying that money. No one was arriving to 45, 40, 45 million euros for, uh, for Flo Balogun. The final package that's included is going to be around 45, a bit more than 40, let's say like this, for, uh, for Flo Balogun, but it will also include a very big sell-on clause. At the moment, I'm not allowed to mention that yet until they sign the contracts, but there is a very important sell-on clause. And so this is something that probably uh, Premier League clubs who are not going to accept to include into the deal. And also for the player, I, from what I heard, the player was very keen on returning to Ligue 1. He was very happy there. He feels that it's the best league for him to develop, to keep going in the same uh, uh, environment and so I think it's a very good opportunity for Flo to play on regular lever there at Monaco and it's a very good club I think God so it's a good move score and sell on at J Young 28 <laughs> come on up tell us where you're from and what's your question for the mighty fab hey I'm uh, in New York uh, on the streets of New York uh, my question is um, <laughs> is there any chance that Arsenal get another forward before the window ends because I still think they need to cover for Saka on the wing, whether it, you know, especially someone who plays on the right side. So I, uh, I'd love your thoughts on that and if you have any information on that. Thank you. Thanks a lot. So, um, look, at the moment, it's not something concrete. They are not negotiating for any offensive player. Uh, what I'm told is that they're very happy with the players they have. And also, sometimes for Arteta, it's not easy mm. not to decide because he wants to involve Kai Havertz, who is not having an easy uh, beginning of the season, but he's a player they 100% trust at Arsenal, so they want to protect him. But at the same time, you have Gabriel Jesus, you have Edwin Ketia, who is doing very well and who looks to be on his best season, probably, so they really trust him. So I think at the moment, they are not going to, to do anything. Then, as always, Arsenal always work like this. It's their strategy since day one, since Edu is there as a director. If they find a good opportunity, they enter the market and try to sign the player. Otherwise, they wait. This has always been the strategy at Arsenal. If you remember one year and a half ago, they wanted a new striker. Pierre Obama Young left the club. Blaovic was there. They wanted Blaovic. Deal collapsed. The player wanted to go to Juventus. Arsenal said, no panic. We will wait for six months. And then they signed Gabriel Jesus in the summer and no one in January. So this is Arsenal's approach. And I think this is the best strategy if you want to be successful. Method really strategic, methodological. God, exactly the opposite of Everton Football Club. Mary O'Neill of Tarzana, <laughs> California. California via Twitter. Who buys Weston McKinney? Does anyone want him after the Leeds experience? Look, at the moment, it's very quiet around McKinney. Uh, it was a strange story this, uh, this summer because the player was out of the project at Juventus. They initially decided not to bring him with the squad of Massimiliano Allegri to the United States tour. Then the situation changed when the new director, Cristiano Giuntoli, joined the club and he decided to involve Weston McKinney in the squad. So now I think he has a chance to stay at Juventus. If something will arrive in the final days of the window, you are still open to letting him go. But at the moment, there are no negotiations ongoing. So it has to be something last minute. Otherwise, he will have a chance to stay. And he was also playing 10 minutes yesterday for Juventus against Bologna. So I think he has a chance to be part of the rotation. Godspeed, Weston, you beautiful human being. <laughs> At K. Crogetti, come on up. Tell us where you are and what is your question for the Romano? 
That hey cake. guys. Hello, um, beautiful. Hi. Tell us where you are. Uh, I am in Charlottesville, Virginia, right outside of that area. It's a big day for Not Virginia on, on the amp with Fab. Where are you? <laughs> tell, us, tell us your question. Thanks, guys. Um, my question is about uh, the Spurs and if you see them signing another forward with Richarlison's troubles at so far or if there's been links to Johnson and Gip Orban and just curious if there's any news on that front. Yes, I think they will do something. Yes, uh, I have positive news for you because while we're speaking here with Rog, they are in negotiations with Nottingham Forest for Brennan Johnson. So Brennan Johnson is a concrete target for, uh, for Tottenham. Uh, today, Brentford presented a proposal around £43 million pounds for Brennan Johnson and it was turned down by Nottingham Forest. They want more than this to let the player go. But also Brentford sources have a feeling that Tottenham are ahead of them also in terms of negotiations on player side. So Tottenham are actively working on a deal for Brendan Johnson. Let's see, because it's never easy to negotiate with Forrest and with their owners. They're very tough in negotiations My for special God. players like Brendan Johnson. Uh, Dan, but Tottenham Dan are Levy. working on Dan Levy and Nottingham yeah. Forrest negotiating. Exactly. That must be just <laughs> not easy. unbelievable. <laughs> it's um, not easy. Very, very quickly, it's... last one for Fab at C Stots. Come on up, tell us where you are and what's your question. Good evening, Raj and Fabricio. This is Christina from mm -hmm. Jackson, Missouri. You talked about Liverpool earlier, Fabricio. However, yes. I have a question about the right back position. Have you heard any information about Liverpool looking into a right back during the last few days of the transfer window? Honestly, no. At this moment, no. I have not heard about any right back. I think they're focused on the midfield. Uh, we mentioned Gravenberg. There could be some other name. But I think they are more focused on the, on the midfielder position than on the right back position. Of course, uh, the situation with, uh, with the right back has always been interesting for Liverpool because they've been looking for some player in that position earlier in the window, like end of May, beginning of June. But now I think their focus is on different positions. Oh, God bless you, C. Stotts. Last question for you, Fab, because I want to get you into those Brennan Johnson negotiations mm -hmm. just to smooth things through. <laughs> they need you, those boys. But when the transfer window closes, Fab, how do you and your partner, Francesco, an amazing bloke, <laughs> how do you celebrate? Is there a drink of choice? <laughs> Is there a meal of choice? Do you guys just party off the, on the lash like Diego Costa? What's the tradition? <laughs> No, the tradition for me is never partying. I'm not a big fan of parties. So my life doesn't change. I think this is my biggest secret, you know, to be consistent. And even when the window closes, I start calling my best sources to say thank you. So I start calling people from 1 a.m. to 3 a.m. to comment about the window, to comment about the day and to enjoy some relax, you know, after the big pressure together with people I know in football and in the industry and together with my friends like Francesco and the others. So for me, it's a special moment because... I can see also the human side of the people who maybe helped me during the summer or I was helping them. So it's, it's mutual, of course. But for me, the most important part of this job is to be consistent when things are not happening, because this is the only way to get news and information when things are happening. I mean, that, that is the most amazing thing about you is you never force it. You're not trying to push stuff out in dead times. It takes an incredible amount of diligence. It takes an incredible amount uh, of tenacity, an incredible amount of just uh, of detective work to separate fact <laughs> from fiction. I think we're all so yeah. bloody grateful for you, Fab. You have changed, Thank you. really changed the way we consume football. Listeners, it's a joy to spend this time with this bloke. Let me once again... Thank our friends at New Balance, our oh, cleat purveyors for the likes of Raz Sterling, Bakayo Saka, Eberich Eze, and oh, uh, all the good vibe gents. For more from Fabrizio, subscribe right now to Fab's podcast. Here we go. Subscribe wherever great podcasts are distributed. And Fabrizio, we wish you and Francesco, wish you strength <laughs> and health through these sleepless nights. Thank you. Grazie mille. Thank you. Thank you. It was a big pleasure. Thanks to you. Thanks to our listeners. And uh, see you soon. Get ready because it's going to be real madness. So we will be ready. Thank you. <laughs> big love. Courage.